All right, guys, any questions from homework? One once, one twice. Hey, I do, uh, since we've got small class right now. Uh, one of my questions was going back through, I was trying to find my notes on it, uh, was, can do you have time to do one of the problems, like uh, the word problems, where we were using milliliters and, and such? There was a question, and I, I must have okay. it. Okay, yes. Um, so you're talking from 120, not 120. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, if, you're fine. If, if, um, yeah. Let me, let me, uh, we have a question um, from 120E. So uh, that I had chatted in, I'm going to work that. Okay. Um, the, what I want to look at today won't take long. And when I've concluded that, I'm more than happy to go back and, and look at the 120 problems you're referring to. Okay, thank you. All right. So, um, let me go back on the homework. Um, and last question. Okay. So, um, okay. All right, so I want to go ahead and it won't hurt to run through the arithmetic here. This is from 4.1, last problem number 20. And it was the last part that there was a question on, and uh, but I'm going to go ahead and work this whole problem through um, and get both answers. So um, we've got on 4.1 number 20 of uh, proportion x over 2 over 50 equals 1.4 over 2 and 4 fifths. And we want to know what number would go in here that would make this true. So um, we are going to say, well, if this proportion is true, then the product of the diagonals, what we call cross multiplication, have to equal one another. So that is two and four fifths times X, these two, would have to equal the product of 2 over 50 times 1.4. All right, so uh, to solve this, I am going to first uh, rewrite this as an improper fraction. So 5 times 2 is 10, plus 4 is 14. So 14 fifths x equals. Now, here, you could go two different routes. Um, it, uh, and this, this 2 over 50 reduces to 1 25th. Um, so uh, let me go ahead and 1 25th. That is 2 goes into 2 once, 2 goes into 50 25 times, times 1.4. So since the first requested answer uh, what x is is in decimal form I'm going to go ahead on my calculator go 1 divided by 25 and hit enter that comes out 0.04 and then multiply that by 1.4 and I get 0.056 so this times this that is 1 25th times 1.4 comes out to 0.056. Now I could go ahead and convert that to a fraction would be 56 over a thousand uh, and then reduce that. Um, but I'm just gonna leave it in decimal form. 
And I could convert this to decimal form, but I'm gonna let the calculator do that, <coughs> excuse me, work. I'm gonna multiply both sides by the reciprocal, five fourteenths. Reciprocals always multiply to be one. That would just leave me one times X, which is X. And what we said was we're good as long as if I multiply it on this side, that I multiply it on this side as well. So X will be in decimal form, whatever 0 0.056 times 5 14 is. So on my calculator, I would go five divided by 14. That gives me a number in decimal form. It's, uh, and I'm not gonna round it. It's um, considerably long. I get 0 0.357142857. I would just take that times, 0.056, and that comes out to, it actually comes out to just 0.02. And it was probably cooked up so you didn't have to round it. Uh, it said, you know, just type it as a whole number or a decimal. All right, so this is the decimal form. And so that would be what uh, you would first answer, x equals uh, 0.02. And then it says, what is the solution in fractional form? All right, so if I want to put that in fractional form, right now I've got X is 0.02. So this is where I look at my place values. Um, tenths, hundredths. So what I would write in fractional form is now, um, you can write zero two over a hundred, but since that zero is not significant there, it's just two. You have a zero there. It's basically all I'm doing is putting it over a hundred because it was in hundreds place. If I had point zero zero two, that would be two over a thousand. Um, so it's just a sidebar there. Are we okay with that? How I came up with the fraction? Yes. Okay. And then from there, reduce it. So two goes into two once, and two goes into 150 times. And so your answer that you would put into the field would be 150. All right. Uh, any other questions on that one? Okay, so any other questions 4.1? No. Nope. Okay, so um, looking at, I'm just thinking about the kind of arithmetic that we uh, will be doing um, on Wednesday. Um, so I have jumped over a good bit of numbers, but it's just, it's more just arithmetic type stuff. Uh, it's out of actually 6.1. And it starts off with just some basic multiplication ideas. Um, and still working with fractions and war of operations. Um, Things like anything times zero is zero. Anything divided by zero is undefined, uh, unless it's zero itself. So um, I'm gonna throw this in here. So zero over two, or anything dividing into zero is zero, or zero in the numerator, is zero. Zero in the denominator is not a number. All we can say there is it is undefined. Now, <clears throat> this is particularly useful information if you are planning on being an elementary school teacher, because this, somebody will think of this, and you may have already thought of it yourself after those two things. 
we always say a number over itself is what? One, right? So let's think this one through. Zero in the numerator is zero. Zero in the denominator is undefined. A number over itself is one. So what in the wide world of sports is zero over zero? What do you think? Zero. Okay. And that seems reasonable because we said zero over any number is zero. But we also said if zero is in the bottom, that it's not a number at all. It's what? Undefined. Yeah. So how do we, and if a number over itself is one, what we have is it, it seems like a paradox. Multiple things that, that should not exist at the same time. I mean, so... This one's, you know, this is, a, again, if you if you were teaching in an elementary setting and you got through these three things, one of your students is going to say, well, what is that? Because it seems like it contradicts all three things. So the answer lies in just basic division. So if I examine each one, I can kind of see why this situation is zero, this one's undefined, and this one's one. And when I look at this, that's, remember, a fraction is always bottom divides in the top, and so two divides into two, one time, remainder of zero. So that makes sense. So the answer is one. When I look at this one, zero again top divide, bottom divided into top two goes into zero zero times and zero times anything is zero remainder of zero so again it works makes perfect sense when I look at this situation and again consider division we said this one's not a number it's, we say it's undefined. Uh, if I try to take the bottom, divide it into the top. And remember, when you divide, your remainder must be less than what you're dividing by. So what number do you put here so that you can subtract from two and get something less than zero? Because anything you put here is going to be times zero, and you're going to get what? Zero here, and it's, it's always going to end up being... I mean, there's just, no, I don't care what number you put here. You're always going to get this remainder that's what greater than what you're dividing by, and that is not possible. Hence, why we say it's undefined. You can't do the division. So I turn my attention to here. I was like, okay, is it one of these three? You know, and if it's one of these three, why is it not the other two? And so if I go back to the same idea of division, what I realize is to do this, this division, can I put a one here? Yeah, I could. Could I put a two here? Yeah, I could. Could I put a three here? Yeah, I could. In fact, I can put any number I want that is zero over zero will end up being any number and this division will work. So the official term we say, okay, it's not zero, it's not undefined, it's not one. Because this can be any number, I can't determine what number it is. And so it is actually called an indeterminate. All right, so it probably won't show up a trivia night if you ever play that. Um, but that's what it's called, an indeterminate. Now, you're not going to have any questions here in regards to this, but you will have a question like that and like that and then multiplying. And But you're also going to have to deal with some exponents and some order of operations 
type problems, which again, I'm looking at what we're going to want to be doing on Wednesday. So I'm going to take one of the tougher ones. I mean, this is titled 6.1 when the homework comes up. So here's a problem. And this is number 12 in this section. Six times three cubed minus three minus five times negative four squared plus 10. And then divided by three times two minus negative three. Yeah. All right. So we've got a whole lot going on here and we're gonna break it down a step at a time and make some observations as we go. So when we get to Wednesday, we're looking at these compounding formulas. That is, we're going to be looking at interest and how it compounds in different ways. And these formulas will involve exponents. Uh, we will have to deal with exponents. And so uh, I wanted to get something that had some exponents in it. And we know by order of operations, uh, we want to work inside innermost grouping symbols, evaluated exponents first. Um, and if you have something fractional, you can kind of work simplifying the top and also work simplifying the bottom using order of operations. So I'm going to say I've got six times, and all I'm going to do is say three cubed. That is three times three times three, which is 27 minus three. So all I've done is evaluate that exponent. Minus five times. All right. And be careful when I ask a question like this, I may be setting you up. What is that? So I just kind of come off to the side here. What is that? Negative 16. Yes, that is it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So now this this sometimes confuses students because you're used to if I square something and multiply something with it by itself, um, and you know a negative times a negative is positive, um, people will assume this is positive sixteen, but it's not. It's negative sixteen. And so the thing about exponents is exponent only works on its base. And it's one of those hidden number things. When I write negative four squared like this, technically what that really is is negative one times four squared. And so what we're saying is that exponent two is not working and the negative is not part of the base. And so I would go negative one times four squared, four squared is 16, 16 times negative one is negative 16. So what does it look like if I do uh, square the negative? So notationally, it would have to look like this. And the negative, see how the negative is inside the parentheses here? And then this is saying negative four times negative four, which is positive 16. All right, so important note about exponents right there. So this is negative 16 plus 10. All right, so all I did was evaluate those exponents. All right, so on the bottom, there were no exponents, so we'll go ahead and start to simplify though a little bit. This is 2 minus a negative 3. Now, technically, really what this is, Subtraction is defined as addition of the opposite. But you really don't want to have to write that all the time. Uh, but 2 minus a negative 3 is really 2 plus opposite of negative 3. 
Uh, we just don't have to always write that. And this is what we call double negation. That is a negative times a negative. It's where we always, or you'll sometimes hear this referred to as the opposite of negative three, which is three, double negation rule. So this right here, anytime you minus a negative, two negatives multiply to be a positive. Therefore, this is really two plus three. All right, so continuing on. Now I could go ahead and say my 27 minus, working inside the parentheses, 27 minus three. Uh, is 24, so this is 6 times 24, minus 5 times. Now, negative 16 plus 10 is a net of negative 6. Okay. So, um, again, when mentally thinking about sign numbers, uh, what you can do is think of both an absolute value, take the larger minus the smaller, that is 16 minus 10 is six, and then assign the sign of the larger of the two numbers. So you go 16 minus 10 is six, uh, the larger one was negative, so my answer is negative. And that will work every single time. In the bottom, I've got three times five. Two plus three is five. All right, so we'll move this way. All right, so six times 24, um, is 144. Now I've got that same situation, double negation. This is really negative 5 times negative 6, which is positive 30. At the bottom I've got 15, 3 times 5. All right, so 144 plus 30. Uh, would be what, 174 over 15. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. All right. So at that point, I would look at, you know, can I reduce it? Um, and yes, so I know it, you know, five is not going to go in the top because it would have to end in a zero or five and two is not going to go in top and bottom. Uh, one's even, one's odd. Remember the trick for three, add the digits. And if that sum is divisible by three, then the whole thing is. Now, one plus seven is eight, eight plus four is 12, which is divisible by three. So I would just figure up what is 174 divided by 3. It is 58. And what is uh, 15 divided by 3 is 5. And so that would be your answer, 58 fifths. Any questions on that? My question is in the bracket part at the bottom. In the brackets, do you always add or subtract those? These? Uh -huh. Okay. Well, it depends upon, you know, what, what is being asked. Uh, I mean, it could be subtraction. It could be addition. But, yeah. Um, and that's – so, um, I, and I wrote down the problem just as I saw it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of grouping symbols, uh, there are three types that you'll see in a problem like this. Parentheses are always the first option. And then brackets, and then if you need, you know, if it's really got a lot going on, you may see braces. Um, when I say braces, that's that. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so you do those parts but, first. But, yes, and and the reason they use the brackets here as opposed to parentheses because there was parentheses here. Right. It's just a so I don't lose track of the grouping symbols. You could actually write this problem with parentheses only, as long as you don't get confused with it. But, uh, so I took care of the double negation, and then again, I always want to um, work inside the grouping symbols first. And, uh, which gets back to that whole, uh, where do I write it? Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. <laughs> so how did you move from two minus negative three 
the two plus three. Okay, that was right here. Yeah. So when I saw the two minus negative three, uh, and I kind of went over, jumped over here, and addition or subtraction is actually defined officially. So anytime I have two numbers, A minus B, the official definition of subtraction is addition of the opposite. Oh, okay. And so see how I went from, I saw the this, I so I said two plus what? Negative. negative negative of negative three or what the way we really verbally phrase this is opposite of negative three so that made it positive three exactly okay. and so when i see this right here the easiest way to think of it is honestly two negatives multiply to be a positive that's okay. right from here to here and then it occurred again honestly it was really the same thing right here where i had minus five times negative six Mm -hmm. that's really plus negative five times negative six. So all I said was, all right, negative times negative is what? Positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, now there's, um, uh, and we've actually done a little bit of algebra in solving proportions. That was 4.1 um, where we were solving for X. Another manipulation and again this gets to these compounding formulas that we are going to be plugging numbers into um, and so I'm now looking at number 13 at 6.1 where I have x equals negative 8 y equals negative 6 and z equals negative eight. It says about, we're gonna evaluate uh, the expression <coughs> uh, Quantity and anything I, when I put things in parentheses, I'll call that a quantity because it has multiple terms. Negative one plus x, then times the quantity six plus y, times the quantity eight minus z. And so we're going to evaluate the expression for these numbers. And so in for each variable, I put these numbers in looking at this because on Wednesday, we're going to be working with formulas and problems where I've got to plug in numbers into a formula, much like what I'm doing here and then compute. So putting in my numbers, I would have negative one plus now X is negative eight. So you see how I did that. Now, I don't technically have to have these parentheses. I do that just kind of for neatness sake. And I've got this plus and then in the X went negative eight. If this was positive eight, I just would have said negative one plus eight. I wouldn't have put the, the two pairs of parentheses inside here. Now this is six plus a negative Y, uh, which uh, is negative six. So six plus negative six, which tells me what the answer is gonna end up being right there. We'll see why in a second. And the last one was eight minus Z, which was negative eight. So I've got them in there, but since it is this whole thing times this times this, I already know my answer is zero. It's gotta be anything times zero zero and this inside here is going to end up being zero uh, but i'll go ahead and finish it out negative one plus negative eight is negative nine if you're adding two negative numbers just add up their absolute value and make the result negative one plus eight is nine both were negative so the answer is negative nine opposites always add to be zero 
And then this one, remember, is going to be 8 plus 8. And so I'm going to go ahead and just say plus 8 is 16. Because again, you got that double negation. Well, from here, negative 9 times 0 is 0. And then 0 times 16 is 0. And that would be your final answer. All right. And there'll be a couple like that. Mm, I think you'll be okay there. All right, so I am going to. Sign is so six point one. Uh, make the due date of Wednesday. And so it is now it is now signed. Uh, six point one. And again, it really shouldn't take you too long. Um, so as always, I would work on my one twenty stuff first and then uh, again uh, go in and, and do 6.1 uh, to 120E. And all right, any any questions on that problem? No. Okay, so uh, I know David, you wanted to look at um, some 120 problems. And so if you, anybody wants to stick around for that or have 120 questions yourself, uh, feel free to stay. Otherwise, you are free to go, and I will see you on Wednesday. All right, and so, okay. I'm going to, let me, I've got to turn it back over to uh, 120. So let me get in there. And All right. All right. So are we looking at problems, David, out of two B. Yes, sir. Um, the one that I, I really, I just couldn't uh, either, even phantom was where they had an IV drip and we added medication okay. to it. Okay. And I uh, just, not that you, I'm ever going to be able to. I mean, medical. I can find it. It's just, do you remember the number of it? No, sir, I don't. I did. Right, I don't have, have to. That. You have to. I know it's towards the latter end. Let me. Uh, uh, It's dosage, it's not a drip. Okay, so I'm looking at now number 13, this is 2B. 4% uh, dextrose solution, which is defined to be 4 milligrams per 100 milliliters. Of solution is given intravenously. Yes. Okay. Suppose a total of 4.875 liters of solution is given over a 15 hour period. We are going to answer some questions, um, three of them. The first one being what is the flow rate in milliliters per hour? Um, and what is the flow rate of indextra and in, dextrous per hour? Okay. So let's see what we can what we can come up with here. So I'm looking at two uh, B. Yeah, I couldn't even find that one to cheat through it. <laughs> Let alone do it right. All right. 
So this is, we got a 4% dextrose uh, solution. Which means, you know, four percent of it is just dextrose, and the other ninety-six percent is, you know, maybe some sort of saline solution or something like that. Um, uh, and now this is saying the same thing. It's saying then that means four milligrams uh, is dextrose per. 100 milliliters of the solution, which again, probably saline solution or something like that. Okay, so this is this is given intravenously. So suppose that we give 4.875 liters. So that's not milliliters, that is liters. Uh, of this solution is given over uh, 50, over a 15 hour period. Okay. So our first question is, we want to, uh, what is our flow rate uh, in milliliters? And I wanted a small in there, not a capital M. Milliliters. Um, per hour. And what is flow rate, the flow rate um, in dextrose? Uh, per hour. Okay. So, um, So when I'm looking at this, what I first see is um, this is given in what? Not milliliters, but because that's, I want to have this flow rate in what? Milliliters. Uh, what I've got here is what? Liters. So right off the bat, I, you know, I need to get the same units. So I can make a calculation that is first off 4.875 what liters per what what we know is over a 15 what hour period. That is liters per what hour. Now, if I do this calculation on my calculator. 4.875 divided by 15, I get 0.325. Again, liters per what? Hour. Okay. So the next question is, is how many milliliters is in a liter? And again, this is where a metric system 
is just far superior uh, any way you cut them. Um, now, uh, it's there are a thousand milliliters per one liter. They are equivalent. All right, so it really just comes down to then if I want to go from liters to milliliters, um, move the decimal place three times. Now, the actual conversion, what it would look like when you see the units cancel out, is where I go 0 0.325 liters per hour and multiply by, again, what is ultimately a factor of one, 1,000 milliliters per what? One liter. And that's where the liters cancel. And 1,000 times this is, again, just the same thing as moving a decimal place. But then when you are converting within the metric system, it's always just a matter of moving your decimal place how many ever times uh, you need to. And that's it. There's no, you know, uh, you, you, that's not when you're you working in U.S. customary. It's always messy. And you've got to go find the conversions. And then if you're converting from metric to U.S. customary, um, such as, and one centimeter is, uh, um, uh, I believe it's two, 2.54 inches per one. Oh, I'm not saying that backwards. Oh, I may be saying that backwards, I think, here. Um, so you take your inches, multiply by 2.54, and that will tell you how many centimeters you but it's, you know, that's one of the few that I can remember. Um, but anyway, that times that would give me uh, 325 milliliters per hour. Okay. So that is it. That's your that answers A. That's as far as what is your flow rate in milliliters per hour. It's 325 milliliters per hour. Questions on that? This part? No, I, I, I someone get that, what, okay. you, what you're doing there. But when okay. it asked that you would have that, the dextrose, and once okay. you said 96% of it would be saline right. and 4%, right. so, it kind of light bulb went off in my head. And that made it 100%. Oh, okay. So let's let's answer find the, our flow rate there. <coughs> now, remember what it was what the four percent dextrose solute that was four milligrams per what one hundred what milliliters. Okay. Now, ultimately, um, so let's see here. Um, we've got. A little bar here. Uh, four milligrams um, per 100 what? Milliliters. Now, for the whole solution, we know we were what? 300 and what? 25 what milliliters per what per hour right so if i took my four milligrams per 100 milliliters and multiplied that by 325 milliliters per what hour let's see what would happen here uh notice the milliliters what cancel out. And what I end up with, and when I do the multiplication, four times 325 divided by 100 is 13. And my units is milligrams per hour. And that would be your dextrose because simply I took the overall flow rate and then I multiplied it by what I actually had in the, you know, 
the dextrose solution, which was this. And you can clearly see those units canceling out here, uh, leaving me just with the milligrams per hour. And that's it. So basically all you need to do on that second part is once you find this, multiply it by the dextrose amount, which was four milligrams per 100 milliliters of solution. Okay. okay, yes. Okay. All right. Well, that was one question. That was poor A. Um, so moving to part B. So part B. Now, if each uh, milliliter contains 12 drops and and all you got to visualize is with a, an IV you, know, you can see the big bag of whatever the solution is and then a tube running out of that and then in, you know, usually into your arm um, there's drip it's dripping uh, you can you can actually watch the drip, and that's and so that drip rate is adjusted depending upon what you're being given and you know and whatnot. Um, they call it the drop factor, and so all you need to know is it is expressed um, as twelve. GTT per milliliter. That is so uh, how much it drips or drops. Um, and the question here is if each milliliter contains 12 drops, um, What is flow rate uh, in units of GTT per hour? So it's getting to this unit here. And again, what this will be a matter of is setting up uh, multiplying out units so that we get units to cancel out and leave us with this GTT per hour. Okay. All right. So um, we call unit analysis. So I think it up. All right. So what would this look like? So let's take what we know. We know we've got what? 12 GTT per one milliliter. So 12 GTT per one milliliter. And our flow rate we had already determined, so I'm going to say times, was 325 uh, milliliters per what hour. Now, so this was our drop rate. This is our flow rate. Notice how the milliliters are going to what? Leaving me with what? GTT per what? Hour. And so it's really just 12 times 325, uh, which is 3,900 uh, GTT 
per hour. Okay. Um, questions on, so that would be answering your second part. Any questions on that? No, once you wrote it out that way, it, I was just making it way too hard. Um, yeah. And, yeah. But I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna screenshot this so I can, I can understand the equation. Absolutely. Now I am recording this, and I will send the links for the YouTube. Uh, you can watch you can watch this again on YouTube. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. I just I worked it for quite a while, and mm -hmm. the longer I did it, the worse I got. Okay. Well, but you put the work into it already, and now that we're going back over, you're you're putting it together. Yes. So. Well, yes. Once you read out the equation that way, I understand where you did the cancellation, and then I under I do know what why you multiplied it to get the GT. Okay. GTT per hour. Yeah, I have right. trouble saying that too. Okay. So last question to complete the problem. It says. Uh, uh, during the 15 hour period, how much dextrose is delivered? Actual dextrose is delivered. So that's our question during 15 hour period. Um, how much? Um, I'm missing, uh, I totally misspelled that. Dextrous. Yes, that's delivered. Okay. So, Here, um, what we know, um, we have figured out from part A. Uh, remember, we, we wanted to know the flow rate of just the uh, dextrose. And that was 13, so that goes back to part A, 13 milligrams per hour. That was the flow rate of just dextrose. So here's just simply this. If I want to know how much dextrose is delivered uh, in a 15 hour period, then if this is milligrams per hour, multiply it by what? 15 hours. See how the hours cancel? This is like 15 over one. And it'll leave me just with milligrams. So 13 times 15 is 195. And so over that 15 hour period, you receive 195 milligrams. And that is it. Good? Yes, very okay. good for me. All right. I have another question though. Uh, um, and this doesn't relate to this one per se, but are there because um, I'm not that familiar with YouTube. I didn't even start watching it until I started these classes. Um, are, do you have other things or other? No. Just what you put up for just, us? Yeah, I, all I'm doing is I'm recording these. Um, I'm recording these video, the, you know, our Zoom sessions. And then I upload them to, I have a personal account. Um, they are public. I mean, anybody can find them if you know, you'd want to. But then I just, but I send you, so after each class, I get them uploaded. So there's a process I have to go through to get them uploaded. Okay. Um, I get them uploaded and I see you'll, so in your email, you'll get a link uh, yes. to the videos. And you just click on that link and it just takes you right there. Okay. Well, I didn't know if you had like a channel like some of the other people because I tried watching uh, a couple yeah, other I, people I, and yeah, I know I it's. I have friends that, that, yeah, they have all kinds of 
crazy stuff on their on their particular. So I have a channel. Um, it is my personal channel, but the only thing there are these Zoom videos. That's okay. It. Yep. I'm not really right. YouTube. I'm just using YouTube. Uh, uh, honestly, I was you know I go through and I, I I will look at you know go search up a music video or you know want to find lyrics or you know how to play a particular song or something. And that was sure. about my YouTube experience and. Uh, and I'm utilizing it here just as a place to put these videos for you guys to go back and, and look at. Okay. Well, they, they have helped and I've had, I've got the ones that you've sent in my school email. I did. Yeah. Okay. And it, it's easy. Once I understand how you're talking rather than going to someone else, mm -hmm. even though they're, they're trying to say the same thing, it doesn't sure. always sound the same right. coming from someone else. So, okay, uh, we had another 120 question. Um, this dealt with the homework from last class uh, in, um, uh, uh, I guess it would have been, um, oh, where? Shoot, hold on a second, I gotta go back to my chat. There we go. Uh, so I guess it's going to be here. Give me one second. Okay. From 3C. All right. So this is 3C, last problem, number 20. Um, and so here's the problem. Uh, suppose I want to cut 20 identical boards of length 8 feet. Um, the procedure is to measure and cut the first board and then use that board to measure and cut the second board and then use the second board to measure and cut the third board, so on and so forth. And then we've got two questions uh, that we want to answer here. Okay, so again, we're going to cut 20 identical boards. of length uh, eight feet. Um, and then again, the procedure is we're gonna measure and cut the first board, then we're gonna use that one to cut the second and then use the second uh, to cut the third and then the third to cut the fourth, so on and so forth. Um, so what we're going to do is, well, the first question uh, is what are the possible lengths of the 20th board If each time you cut the board, there's a maximum error of plus or minus one fourth of an inch. plus or minus one-fourth of an inch. So it could be a quarter inch too long or a quarter inch too short. All right. So right off the bat, 
He has, you have the, each time I make a cut, I could be a quarter inch too long or a quarter inch too short. Um, these errors are going to accumulate. So that's the first thing, man. We definitely, uh, this could be off a good bit. Um, so, um, you know, the first board is measured and then cut. The second board is measured by using the first board as a reference and then cut. The third board is measured by using the second board and then cut. And you keep doing this until you got your 20 boards. All right. <coughs> So, and we're going to have a, uh, again, two air bounds here. One's on the short end, one's on the long end. So let's first figure up on the short end, all right? Um, now what we know is, um, if we're gonna go to the shorter end, we're gonna get 20 boards uh, at the end. And we're gonna figure up what is the length of that 20th board when every board is cut one fourth of an inch shorter than the previous board, okay? Um, and so the first thing you should observe here is we got a unit problem. I've got boards of what I want of length eight feet and my error here is in inches. So let's just put it in inches. Um, so we'll do that first. So eight feet times 12 inches to one foot. So my feet cancel. Eight times 12 is 96. So we'll think of the boards needed to be in 96 inches. Now the length of each board can be calculated by subtracting a quarter inch from the length of the previous board. Um, So, and I want 20 total boards. So if I take 96 inches and subtract 20 times one fourth of an inch, that would give me, and 20 times a fourth, four goes into 25 times, five times one is five, or a quarter of 20 is five. Um, so, 96 minus five is 91. And that would be on the short end. Okay. So it's possible um, uh, that your board could be as short as 91 inches. Okay. So on the upper end would be 96 inches, but then plus so it could be, you could have as much air uh, on, on a, a quarter inch longer than what it should have been. So that's 96 plus five, uh, which would be 101 inches. So that 20th board could be between 91 inches and 101 inches. Are we okay with the first part? Yes. Okay. All right. A little so, simple, but before the one fourth, what is that called? Uh, bu, 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 this right here. Yeah. Okay. So anytime um, uh, I have a number that it could be both positive or negative as opposed to saying one fourth, you know, writing it twice as one fourth and negative one fourth, saying my errors could be either one fourth longer or negative one fourth shorter, mm -hmm. kind of condense it. So I only write one fourth once. It's understood there's two numbers here, positive one fourth and negative one fourth. Oh, okay. 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 All right, so um, this symbol comes up, there is sidebar here. A little bit of algebra. If you have the equation x squared equals some number a, 
because uh, the, the number that goes into the variable will get squared and we know if we square a negative, it's positive. There's actually two possibilities here. It's X equals not just the square root of A, but also the negative. And so this is actually how we write it, plus or minus, and it's indicating two numbers. But again, that's just a little bit of algebra there. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, but yeah, that's all it means. It just means there's two possibilities, positive one fourth or negative one. Okay, so the second part of this is kind of asking the same thing. Uh, what are the possible lengths of 20th board? Like the decimals, just throw me off. Gotcha. Uh, 20th board. Um, get the max error. Um, is plus or minus uh, 0.8 percent. Okay. Now, it's not quite the same deal here uh, because this is a relative area. You see that percentage, right? And so let's go. Um, so let's kind of figure this out. So. Um, and we'll do the same thing that we were um, doing before. Uh, that is, let's figure out what the short end would be. You know, the 20th, what would be the shortest that 20th board could be. Now, um, since we are, what, 0.8%, first off, so that first board is 100%. If I subtracted... 0.8%, that would leave me with 99.2%. Okay. All right. All right. So that is, <clears throat> it would be, nine, you know, if I, if I cut that first board, um, um, and I was off by 0.8%, uh, then it would be 99.2% of what the original length now, or what the length should have been, which was uh, what we figure up 96 inches. So it would be 96. Um, times, and remember this works when you're working with the percentage here, it's going to work just the same as if you were calculating a tip, you know, at a restaurant. So if you, if you were figuring up, um, you know, you got your bill and you wanted to give them a 20% tip, you would take whatever that amount was. It's just, I'm going to throw a number here. Uh, let's say your restaurant bill was $56. Then you want to give them a 20% tip. You'd multiply by 0.2. So 20% uh, 56 is 11.2. So your tip would be $11.20. This is no different. If I had a 96 inch board and I want to know what is 99.2% of that, then I would multiply, put it in decimal form. 0.992. So notice how the decimal point came out front here. All right. Now, and then whatever that is. Now, but the second board, right, would be 99.2% of this. So this is the length of your first board. Length. 
we're going to see his pattern here, length of first board. Now the length of the second board would be whatever this, and I, you know, we didn't get the cap, but whatever that number is, times 0.992 again. And then the third board would be 96 times 0.992 times 0.992 times 0.992 and so on and so forth. So what you end up with, and you would do that 20 times because you're gonna cut 20 boards. And so once I see that pattern, I can just say, take my 96. I know for that 20th board, it's gonna be multiplied by 0.992 20 times. And as an exponent, that is 0.992 to the 20th power, which gives me 81.75 inches. This was inches. Okay. So in this case, it could be as short as 81.75 inches. Now, to do the calculation for the long end, what you would do is take your 100% and not subtract 0.8, but add 0.8. Um, or, well, yeah. Um, so if I did that, 100% plus 0.8%. And certainly that's going to give me 100.8%, right? So converting that to a decimal is 0 0.1.008. So your calculation would look like 96 inches times 1.008 to the 20th power. Uh, which is a 112.59 inches. And so that would be the longest it could be. All right, so the thing about the second part again is it's uh, a little bit uh, more technical just because again, you're dealing with percentages and and so you would take that you know first to get the shorter end take your percentage and subtract whatever percent uh, it could be shorter than get that number convert it to a decimal form by just moving the decimal place twice and then just realize that pattern you know you, you cut your first board it could be this much a percentage off so that times that and that would tell you the length of your first board. And then whatever that number is, times that percentage again, because it's going to be that percent of this, your second, third, and then again, you would do it 20 times. You know, So how many ever boards you need, that would end up being the power you would have here. And when you do the longer side of it, instead of subtracting, you would add. And then that in decimal form would give you... Uh, the required number you would need here. So short end, long end. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, gang. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh,